Yeah, the question of, of um, equality of opportunity for immigrants at this day and time is a really difficult one because you're talking about, um, I can't help but think of the class issues, right? I mean, we know, I know as a Latino, I was uh, given preference. My application was given preference when I applied to Georgetown University. There's no doubt about it. Um, I know that that you know immigrants, uh, because the academic world, the business world. I know businesses are banks in particular in the D.C. area are 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 are, are, are pulling their hair out trying to find Spanish-speaking tellers and even VPs and branch managers and senior VPs. They can't find bilingual people. So I'd say an immigrant who's well-educated, who, um, who has the capacity to fill these jobs, it's a great time to be an immigrant in America, right? And with a globalized economy, you know, you need more globalized workers. Um, so you're either, you either, if you're an immigrant or if you're an American who's learning a foreign language, you're going to increase your wealth generating potential, no doubt. However, if you're a low-skilled worker, and an immigrant, I would say now is not a good time to be looking for work in this country. I think the sheer fact of the matter is you have a country right now that's divided on how to, how to address the future of some of our hardest working grassroots immigrants. Um, we have a country that um, kind of wants it both ways. They want the cheap food, they want the cheap uh, landscaping costs, they want, um, you know, the cheap uh, restaurant meal. Um, you know, they know what cheap la labor means to their lives, um, and yet uh, they can't get their arms around the fact that for that to continue this way, you know, we need uh, pools of immigrant labor congruent with a demand. And I mean, if even the President of the United States, a very ardent conservative, who once had a very large conservative base that would listen to him, can't get this passed, then we're in trouble. You know, we're in trouble. And so I would, the last thing I would want is for any undocumented immigrant to think, you know, I'm in trouble, I better get out of here. <laughs> Not at all. What, what we don't need is, is fear in the community. What we need is strength and resolve to stick it out, work with us, help us, there's so many other ways you can get politically engaged without having the right to vote. And we saw that, right? We saw that April 10, 2006. We saw half a million people on the streets of D.C. and in cities all over America. That was the single largest coordinated protest in American history. That beat everything. Vietnam War, you name it. So we know there's energy around this issue. The, the challenge for us is to keep that energy focused to, and to keep people from getting depressed about the failures that we're you know, this country has had on this front and to keep people with their eye on the prize. It reminds me a lot of civil rights. I mean, the, 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 the connections here to the civil rights era of this country are huge. And I think a lot of African-American leaders are recognizing that. Kwasi Nfume, who ran for the, for the Senate in the state of Maryland, uh, was at our very first rally um, before April 10th. We had a, a, an initial rally on the steps of the Capitol. He was there. Other African-American leaders have come out strong and said there are clear similarities between what you're going through and what we went through in the 60s. I don't think anybody, I would hope, vast majority of Americans would not argue against the civil rights you know, laws and the, and the, and the civil rights uh, changes in this country that happened in the mid-60s. Of course, you're going to have your far-right wackos who probably wish that you know, they could still go to their own water fountain. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the vast majority of Americans realize that civil rights was great for this country. And I think the vast majority of Americans 30 years from now will realize that passing comprehensive immigration reform and coming up with future flows that are congruent with demand, because we got two issues here, right? We have the legalization of all those that are here undocumented. We also have what kind of future flows of immigrants do we need? We know, and that's where the whole question of the um, guest workers comes into play. You know, we know for a fact that certain industries, the retail industry, the restaurant industry, the growers, uh, the construction workers, we know that across the board, this country needs access to that labor. Um, we can't outsource everything. <laughs> I know a lot of people would probably like to, but the simple fact of the matter is we need work to be done in this country with affordable labor. And the industry knows that. So what future flows do we need? Now, the problem becomes, 
who wants to come here and work and, and go home. So what I would argue is any future flows that we go ahead and assume a certain percentage of them, and I don't know what that is, but I would imagine a high percentage of them are going to fall in love with America, as immigrants have done for over 200 years, and decide to stay. And I would say, as a country that believes in, in immigrants, that, that it has, is an immigrant country, that we're going to have to let those who want to stay, stay, and help them become part of the permanent fabric of, of our society. That's probably where there's the most contention. And if you look at what happened with the bill and why it failed, it had everything to do with that.